laver lige en kort lydtest. All right, sorry for that. I just had to do a quick uh, sound test to make sure that the sound was coming through uh, all right. And now I can take these off as well. I don't need them anymore. It was just to ensure that the sound was coming through fine. All right, welcome to Mike's Observatory and another series, another one of my lectures in Introduction to Astronomy. I know that uh, I have been away quite a while from these lectures and I'm terri terribly sorry about that. Also, I have decided to change my um, my platform from Twitch to YouTube and even though the little uh, icon, I haven't had time to change it, uh, will still say Twitch lectures, these are now officially going to be YouTube lectures, not Twitch lectures. So uh, I hope that I can reach a uh, broader audience by doing things this way. As always, if you have any kind of questions you want to ask me, then you can do it in the in the chat. I'll try to uh, be aware as much as I can about it uh, when I'm lecturing. It is out here on my second screen. Let me just see if I can point there in my second screen. So, uh, I mean, my primary vision is going to be this way because that's the screen I'm going to show you and, and we're going to share together. But um, yeah, I hope that uh, we can uh, we can we can make it work anyway. And uh, if you have any questions about astronomy, then please ask me. If you think the sound is too loud, then I can change that. If you think it's too low, then I can change that as well. Um, I mean, we're going to, uh, to uh, change these things and depending on how fast we're going, in this lectures, we will um, maybe take on another subject. This is about the sun, but there's obviously more to astronomy than, than just the sun. So uh, I don't know. We, we'll see how it goes, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, depending on how much time I'm going to use on this lecture, we will uh, have uh, a little break uh, at some point. But if it's less than 45 minutes, I don't think that that a break is warranted. Uh, so, uh, but but you can you can also tell me in chat if you want that. I know that I have uh, put out a lot of videos here on uh, this channel about flat Earth, and if you have general questions for me about flat Earth, then you can certainly ask them at some point. But I would like for you to respect that this introduction, this course here, is about introduction to astronomy, and therefore not necessarily about flat Earth. But it's definitely not about flat Earth, so I would like for you to respect that and keep your questions in that sense. But other than that, if you just want to follow along, uh, then you can do that. If you have questions, then ask them, and yeah, you know. I would like to state a disclaimer, that is that these courses are by no means meant to be um, an alternative to having real education about astronomy, attending real courses at high school, university, or what have you. It is definite, most definitely not intended to be that way. This is more intended to be sort of a supplement to the education that you already have, or if you just have sort of a, a general interest in, in astronomy. And the reasons uh, for that are, the are several. First of all, this is not an official, I mean, university or, or, or educational system. It's me as a private person trying to tell you what I know about astronomy. And that's that's it. That's all. 
Second of all, I don't have the tools necessary to test you, to prepare you for going out to an exam or anything like that. I don't have the means to exam you or prepare you for exams. So these are sort of the two main reasons. And the third, obviously, is that I can't extend you any diploma or anything that can sort of signify that you have attended a course and completed it. So you should always see these courses as a supplement or as sort of a general way to gain knowledge about something that you have a particular interest in. With that being said, let's get on with this. So as you can see here, the name is the sun, our nearest star. And <clears throat> if you want to, uh, to uh, ask a little trick question for someone, uh, whether they sort of uh, is uh, aware if they're awake or anything like that, you can ask them, uh, what is the nearest star to the earth? I would argue that 90, 95% of all the people you could ask that question will say something like uh, Proxima Centauri or Alpha Centauri or something like that. And while that technically is true, they forget that the sun that the Earth is orbiting is also a star. So, uh, yeah. And of course, attending the, these courses, I would almost say that coffee is mandatory. If you don't have any coffee in your cup, Go get it now. <laughs> All right, let's let's move on. So, first, I think we should take sort of a, a glance at uh, at our solar system. So, our solar system is uh, usually um, <clears throat> you could say it's divided into three parts. Obviously, we have the sun in the middle. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm just jabbing out here and forgot for forgetting to yeah. There we go. Sorry about that. If you want to see. The sun, our nearest star. That was what I was talking about. Sorry, sorry. All right. So the glance of our, of our solar system, we usually divide it, you can say we divide it into three parts or two, depending on how you, you want to see things. Obviously, we have the sun in the middle, so that could be the, the first part, the star that we sort of, uh, all the all the planets are orbiting. Then we have the inner planets that is uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and then we have the outer planets that are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And and the reason why I divide these into sort of two parts is that the inner planets we also call them rock planets, uh, basically meaning that they are rock from through and through. Whereas the outer planets are either gas giants or ice giants. So, and, and the way we distinguish between those is that Jupiter and Saturn are usually seen as gas giants because they are primarily made of gas. They probably have an ice or rock core in the middle. Whereas Uranus and Neptune are more icy than they are gas, so roughly half and half, something like that. Uh, we're going to see in more detail how they are divided in, in later in the course. But for now, you can just think of it as we have the inner planets are the rock planets and the outer planets are the gas, gas planets or gas giants, if you will. So if we should take a look at the sun at a glance. So you already know, hopefully, from, I don't know, um, elementary school, that the distance from the Earth to... Uh, the sun is what we call one astronomical unit. That is 149,598,000 kilometers. 98,000 kilometers. It's obviously because the orbit of the Earth is a little, uh, it's a little bit elliptic. So at the maximum, it's 152 million kilometers, and the minimum, it's 147 million kilometers. When you watch. A sunrise or sunset you are actually not watching the sunrise or the sunset you're actually watching um, when you're looking at the uh, sun rise the sun was actually already above the horizon technically uh, roughly eight minutes ago and when you are watching a sunset the sun had already set eight minutes ago and that is because the light light 
The speed of light is finite. It is roughly 300,000 kilometers per second. So uh, the distance from uh, the Earth to the Sun means that it takes roughly eight and a half minutes for light to get from the Sun to the Earth. Oh yes, let me just make a disclaimer right here. I don't know how my audience is. Uh, let me just adjust the camera a little bit uh, here. Let's see. Something like this, perhaps, and something like this. And move me out to the side. If you want me to make the camera smaller, if you think it should be placed in another position, then please let me know. Um, what I was about to say, and yeah, yes, one thing. My glasses are old and terrible, so they constantly sort of slide down my nose. So if you if you see me constantly fiddle with them, it's because they slide down and I have to put them back up again. Um, if you are from any country who primarily uses uh, the awful, awful empirical system, then be advised and aware that I will almost exclusively use i will exclusively use the metric system in this course here the reason for that is um, again manifold uh not a manifold but manifold um many-sided one is that i have been I, i've grown up and is accustomed to the metric system so suddenly have to switch to the empirical system would be i mean impossible almost i would say I would have to recalculate anything that I'm going to talk about. Second of all, uh, the consensus in science is actually to use the metric system, not not the empirical system. So uh, that's one other reason to switch uh, as quickly as you can. I don't know why America and, and Britain had, ha, ha, haven't done that yet, but yeah. All right, let's take a quick peek. We already talked a little bit about the light travel, uh, the, the light travel time. The mean angular diameter when you look at the sun uh, from the earth is 32 arc minutes. The radius is uh, almost 700,000 kilometers. That is 109 earth radii. The mass is uh, one point, let's just say two times 10 to the 30th kilogram. That is uh, 3.3 times 10 to the fifth earth masses. masses. The composition by mass is 74% uh, hydrogen, 25% helium, and 1% other elements. And that is usually what we refer as heavy elements, or as astronomers call them, metals. So we have hydrogen, helium, and metals. Very easy. And you can say also composition by num number of atoms. It is almost, oh, I mean, it's over 90% hydrogen, a little bit helium, and very, very little other elements. The mean density is rough, pretty high. It's uh, 1,410 kilograms per cubic meter. The mean temperature of the surface is 5,800 5, Kelvin. And the center temperature is uh, 1.5 or 1.6, if you will, times 10 to the 7 Kelvin. And if you don't know, the difference between Kelvin and Celsius is that Kelvin has the absolute um, lowest possible value. I mean, that is minus 273.5 uh, degrees Celsius. That is zero. So uh, the the freezing point of water would be 273.5 uh, Kelvin, which is uh, zero degree uh, Celsius. Which one is the better of the two? I mean, Astronomers and scientists usually tend to use Kelvin, but I mean it's it's a simple it's a simple matter of subtraction or addition, going from one to the other. So uh, yeah, the surface temperature is pretty important because it is also connected to what we call a black body spectrum. From that you can actually um, you you can you can calculate or you can sort of figure out what the uh, the temperature uh the surface temperature of the of, of a star is and and there's a, a distinct connection between the spectrum of a star and its surface temperature so for instance very hot stars they uh have a, a very uh, hot they are around seven fifteen thousand twenty thousand kelvins they are blue 
and very cold stars around 3000 to 1000 kelvins they are very red so we have a we have a very distinct connection and and that was um Annie Jump Cannon and uh, oh, I can't remember her name, uh, Lewitt Hewitt, something like that. Uh, those two were the primary women behind uh, this discovery here. The luminosity of the sun is 3.9 times 10 to the 26th watts. So that's really, 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 that's really high. Uh, compare that with a normal light bulb. <laughs> Uh, the distance, distance from the center of the galaxy is 8,000 parsecs or 26,000 light years. Parsecs and light years, we're going to talk about that later on. Uh, if I had to sort of uh, quickly introduce it, I would say that a parsec is sort of a um, contraction of the word per arcsec. I'm not sure that really is a contraction, but I mean, it, it is. Uh, so the, the the way that the parsec is defined is that if you have something that is one uh, light year away and has a size of, um, let me see, no, sorry. If you have something that is one degree in size uh, when you look at it, so its angular size is one degree and its uh, real size is one astronomical unit, then it's said to be one parsec away. So that's how you define a parsec. If you don't want to, uh, I mean, concentrate really much about what that is yet, just see it as a distance measurement, just as light year is. It's basically just how far the light can travel uh, in one year. The orbital period is uh, around the galaxy, of course, is 220 million years, and the orbital speed is roughly 220 kilometers per second, again, also around the, the galaxy. Let's go on. Uh, the star, our sun, is... Uh, is uh, there are three main ways that stars can be um, leveled, or, I mean, um, zoned, if you will. For small stars, that is red stars, they are usually only convective zones. For medium-sized stars, or actually dwarfs, or a little larger than that, they are usually radiative in the inner zone and convective in the outer zone. And for very large stars, giants and supergiants and hypergiants, it's the reversed. They are usually um, convective in the inner zone and uh, radiative in the outer zone. So what are the differences? A convection zone is when you have something, take for instance, a very simple example, if you boil a pot of water, when you get to a certain point, you'll see that the water begin to, to bubble. So we have bubbles forming on the surface of the, uh, the pot and they will rise up to the top. And that is basically convection. What is happening is that at the surface, at a local surface part of, of the, the pot, the water will vaporize and vapor is uh, lighter than water. So it will uh, rise up that, that, that parcel of water is warmer than the, the surroundings. So they will rise up, give, sorry, <laughs> they will rise up and they will, I mean, deliver some energy heat to the surface of uh, the, the surface of the water, the surrounding air. Hence, they will be a little bit cooler than the surrounding water. And then they will go back to the bottom again and it will repeat. So convection is sort of this movement that you have of water in the pot when it's boiling and that is basically what you have here in the sun as well and uh, when you look at pictures from the sun you'll usually see that it's sort of tiled it looks like it's sort of divided into little tiles and it's actually these convection zones that you can see the radiative zone here in simply means that it's photons that is carrying the energy so the core is delivering the energy if you will and uh, that on the surface of, I mean, on the surface of the core, if you will, 
the, those inner layers here will uh, will give rise to radiation traveling through the layers. So there's no real movement of of matter down here. It's only radiation and because the sun is so big and because there is a very very high risk or or i mean um, not risk but the probability that uh, one of the photons will hit another particle down here and then uh, deliver its energy to that and hence it will just i mean heat up this this area here um it can actually take up to a million years for a photon to travel from <laughs> from the uh, surface, if you will, of the core out to the convection layer. So that's how the sun basically works, and and the convection layer is sort of a movement of matter. It's not it's not a, uh, a I mean a it's not a uh, a uh, transfer of matter. It's more a movement of matter. There's no matter that is transferred from this layer up to this layer here, but it's more, it's just circling around as the circles indicate. So that's the inner parts of the uh, the sun. We also have the corona and you usually don't see it, but uh, when we have like this image here, we have a, um, a solar eclipse, you can actually see the corona. And, and the reason why you wear these uh, protective uh, glasses when you uh, watch a, 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 an eclipse, solar eclipse, is that the corona is is very bright and it's very rich in energetic photons, particularly um, high energy photons like ultraviolet and uh, likewise. So that is why you use protective glasses to not um, burn out your eyes. Even though most of the sun is... Um, is uh, is uh, covered you will still get very much blinded and can lose your sight if you look at the sun like this for an extended period of time so you can ask yourself why is that well it's because when you look at the sun in its entirety without having an eclipse your eye your pupil will contract to let very very little light into uh, very few photons into your eye and hit your retina but when you have a solar eclipse, there's it's very dark. So, so the corona can sort of light up the sky as much as the sun can. But since it puts out all of these energetic photons and you open up your eyes and, and there's very dark, your pupils will also open up to let a lot of photons in. And if you have a very high degree of these energetic dangerous photons, if you will, uh, enter your eyesight, then you can you can you can get reduced eyesight or even go blind. So that's why you use protective glasses. And here are these, um, like I said, these convection zones that I talked about. You can see it, it looks a little bit like uh, the the sun is tiled. That's not really the case. What's going on is that you sort of have this is a this is a sort of double convection zone zone in the middle. You have uh, the hotter gas rising up and delivering some energy out here to the the surroundings uh, above the sun. Um, that energy is usually in the form of of um, of photons. So if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure it should be. Um, uh, what you call um, infrared photons and the reason why we have this corona is when these energetic it can also be uh, ultraviolet it's probably not more ultraviolet uh, photons they they hit the gas that is around the sun so some gas will evaporate if you will from the sun will escape some will sort of rise from the convection zones and then get down again and get captured so there is some ex I mean ex extend uh, some um, delivery of gases to the surrounding but not by bulk it's it's minute um, so so what happens here in these zones is that the hotter gas rises um, releases some energy to the surroundings then gets cooled down and then I mean uh, travels down through the outer layer 
So so that would be out here. And that's why it is bright in the middle. It is less bright here. You can see this this um, part here. And then it's very dark here. That's sort of the distinct disti distinction between these uh, zones. It's all called, also called granulation, as you can see. I mean, it should say the surface and not the surface. <laughs> But that's the connection between how the sun looks and these uh, convection zones here. One other thing is that we have the, the, the photosphere. So that's the, sort of the top part of the sun that you can see. And what's interesting here is because you are looking at a slightly less part of the photosphere, I mean, more directly into the brighter parts of the sun, when you look at it at the center, you'll see it as a bright yellow. But when you look at it from sort of the, the top part here, the more you look at it, it will become darker. So that's one interesting fact about the sun when you look at it. And that is also if I should touch a little bit, just a little bit, on the discussion on um, flat versus, versus spherical and all that. This can only happen on a sphere. It would not happen on, it will only, it would not happen on a bulb because it works by a completely different principle. So it would only work on a sphere that's basically gas. All right, let's uh, continue. So the spectrum of the sun is roughly a black body spectrum. And when I made this, um, I made this um, spectrum using a spectrometer at uh, the University of Copenhagen, which was one of my last courses. We don't have a calibrated um, intensity that would have been very nice, but instead we just have photon counts, but we, we didn't find any, any way to calibrate it with known sources. Coffee break. But if you're fitted a black body spectrum, uh, back black body curve or plank curve to this spectrum here, you would see that there are some parts that are missing. And that is primarily because they get absorbed by uh, both the surface of the sun, but mostly the the um, the uh, the atmosphere of the Earth. But generally, you can see that we have these lines here. And these lines show us that what gases are present in the sun. But be mindful when you sort of try to extract from this um, so such a spectrum here, if you make it yourself, is that parts of the spectrum, parts of these absorption lines will also not only be from particles in the surface or, or the photosphere of the sun, but they will generally also be, uh, some of them will be from the... Uh, the Earth atmosphere, particularly something like oxygen. We have a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere that will definitely um, make some absorption absorption lines. Um, one other reason that we have this gap here, if you don't know it uh, yet, is that the lines here are roughly between, uh, I mean, the, the, the visible spectrum is from roughly 400 up to 800, 900, somewhere around there. Uh, the reason why we have a, a gap in in intensity of light here down around this area here, even though the, the Planck spectrum would be, be higher, is that uh, we have a lot of absorption of the uh, ultraviolet light in, uh, in the atmosphere. Luckily for us, because ultraviolet can uh, damage our cells and the DNA in our cells. So uh, it's highly energetic and um, can be dangerous in certain certain aspects but this basically tells us in this case here we could put we could label more of these lines uh, we just chose to do four in our group so we can definitely say there is definitely hydrogen in the uh, atmosphere because we have hydrogen alpha line hydrogen beta line and hydrogen gamma line we also have a natrium line here but we can't say just from looking at it whether this is from our atmosphere or the sun. If I'm not mistaken, when we looked it up, uh, this is also from the sun. So there's definitely also natrium in the sun. 
um, or potassium, sorry. <laughs> it's called potassium in, uh, in English. All right. But uh, I mean, this is a spectrum that if you have a, a, and you can buy these for, quote, right, relatively few, um, few, few money. Uh, not, it's not very, it's not super expensive. It's not like you have to throw down a couple of hundred thousand to get such a spectrum. I think it's about, in, in Danish money, it's around three to four thousand or thereabout, maybe six thousand. So, Somewhere between five hundred to a thousand dollars, I would say. Let's uh, let's go on. If there's no more questions to this spectrum here, I will I'll continue. Obviously, we have the wavelength down here in nanometers, and we have, like I said, the intensity in counts. So nanometers is the Ninth, ten to the ninth, ten to the minus minus ninth, if I'm not mistaken, of a meter, uh, is it's very very small. <laughs> you can look it up. Um, in astronomy, we tend to use either nanometers or something called angstrom. Angstrom, and an angstrom is simply just a factor of ten higher. So if you have four hundred nanometers, that would be four thousand angstrom. That's very simple um, transfer. And I would argue that the reason why we use Angstrom, it's mostly, I would say, a tradition. It's been a tradition for many astronomers to use that. Um, because, I mean, when it's a factor of 10, it basically doesn't, I mean, doesn't make any difference. So we have uh, we have some uh, uh, theoretical models of the sun. So if you have some 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 data from the sun, you can make a, some parameterized models. And on that, you can sort of figure out what is the luminosity, for instance. Um, so at the center of the sun, it's zero. So despite the fact that the core is very, very, very hot, it is also very dense, meaning that all the photons that sort of get created there is almost instantly absorbed by another particle. And so if you could Look at the sun. Just look at it. It would actually most likely be black. I mean, in the center, if you can be in there without burning up, you'll you'll be in a, a relatively dark place. But as you move out, you can see at uh, point two, um, that is roughly twenty percent out of the distance from the uh, sun center, you'll get almost one hundred percent luminosity, and that is going on all the way out to the surface of the sun. Interestingly enough, the mass of the sun is shifted towards the outer parts, roughly. So at uh, roughly 60% of, uh, of uh, it takes 60% of the uh, sun to where the mass becomes fullest. So the outer parts is very, very, very um, light, if you will. And it's sort of in the uh, in from the center out to uh, 0.6 of the solar radius that the mass sort of increments almost almost uh, exponentially the temperature it drops also something i would call exponentially something like that apart it's almost linear so at the center of the sun you have uh, 16 million kelvin and that is gradually reduced all the way up to 0.8% uh, of the solar radius. So that's the very outer layers where it's down to these uh, roughly uh, 5,000, 4,000 uh, Kelvin. And finally, um, thank you. I um, would very much like to try to pronounce your name, but I mean, I will butcher it horribly. Lek Raj Saini. Sorry. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> um, and here we have the, finally, we have the density. Um, that is um, kilograms per cubic meter. So obviously, because we have the core where things are very, very, very tightly squeezed together. You can, you can, you can almost imagine it. You have all of this mass 
of the sun that is extremely big and all of that mass just wants to squeeze the sun together almost like if you sort of imagine sort of a big strong guy trying to oh, that was a cat <laughs> oh man uh trying to sort of squeeze it together and i haven't really talked about this but obviously the because the sun isn't just um squeezed together to a little uh, black hole there has to be a counter reaction that counter reaction comes from the radiation of uh, of the core so the sun is actually in what we call a uh, unstable equilibrium and unstable because if you change one of the parameters just a little bit it will change dramatically so but we're going to go more into that when we talk more about what will happen to stars in general when they uh when they um in their life if you will but obviously we have a very very high density in the center and again we have almost a linear drop here to around 0 0.18 or something like that and then from 0 0.2 out we have roughly an exponential drop i mean it's hard to see on these curves here or these graphs here where exactly it goes from linear to exponential and sort of figure out this is 0 0.15 so 0 0.16 something like that but as you can see the ma majority of the density the, the highest of the density is definitely in the center of the sun when you go just i mean above uh, sorry beyond the 0 0.2 uh, the 20% the of the radius, it's almost nothing. I mean, 40,000 kilograms, 40 tons per cubic meter is, of course, something. It's not nothing. But compared to 160 ton per ton per cubic meter, it's it's very, very light. And and I mean, they don't even put numbers on it here. It's, it's definitely not a log logarithmic scale. But still, I mean, this is 80, so it's probably around 20,000. But... It depends on where this curve actually ends and again i mean these figures are probably reasonable accurate but just remember try to remember that this is say like i said it's a theoretical model of the sun it's not i mean we we obviously haven't flown out to the sun and measured the, these numbers here so we 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 make some observations of the, that's one of the consequences of being an astronomer if you're particle physics or physicist or if you are an uh, a atomic physicist or something like that you can you can make uh, instruments you can make colliders you can make accelerators and all that but as an astronomer most of the things that we are working on here i mean one thing that might sort of be a little bit different is that astronomers can also work at cern to try to um, find the particles uh, responsible for the um, the the dark matter. We, we are looking for dark matter particles, and also for that matter, um, dark energy. If we can find that, but basically dark matter. So that's possibly, as, as far as I can see, it, the only way where astronomers can make experiments to to sort of f find out things. But in general, we are only. I mean, our only uh, tools for getting more knowledge about the universe is to observe we big that's why we build bigger and bigger telescopes and send stuff out into the to uh, to to the to the universe out out into space it's because uh, our primary way of observing things is still i will say generally using um the electromagnetic spectrum with one slight i mean recently we had a slight I mean shift in that because we actually found a new way to uh, observe things and that is using um, gravity in essence in itself by i mean measuring gravitational waves but still in that case we use uh, lasers which is the uh, electromagnetic spectrum to facilitate the observation but the observation itself is uh, waves in the in in the metric in the the fabric of space so that is a different way to observe and and hopefully we will uh i know that we will uh, exploit that uh, much more in the future one other very interesting thing about the sun is that all of the planets they rotate obviously uh, the same perhaps with exception of some of the gas giants they they also rotate 
differently. They have a, sort of a um, different speeds, but particularly for the sun, uh, the sun, just like any other planet or most other planets, it has a, uh, a magnetic field. And what happens with this uh, differentiated uh, rotational speed of the uh, of the sun is that this magnetic field get twisted around with this rotation, as you can see here. And 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 you can you can imagine if you sort of take a spring and you try to elongate it and elongate it and elongate it, and at one point the spring will just go boing, go back to its original state. And that is also exactly what happens here on uh, on the sun. So when this magnetic field has been twisted and twisted and twisted and twisted and twisted, at some point it will just spring, spring. And that is what generate these uh, perturbances, uh, these magnetic uh, outbursts of matter. And be minded that these outbursts, they are usually many, many times the, the size of the Earth. And that is also what we usually call sunstorms or solar storms, which uh, can render some of our satellites inoperable for a matter of time or, or sometimes completely destroy them. If you look at the, uh, what's it called? The uh, NASA's Solar Observatory, it has, it has a special name. You can actually see whenever a, a small outburst of energy comes from the sun because then you, you get... If, if you remember an old, uh, I, I'm that old, if you have an old um, uh, cathode ray tube TV, and with, not with digital, but analog um, signals at the old antenna, when you shifted between the uh, the channels, you had this, uh, and these, we, we, in Denmark, we call them ant fights. So you have, the, you have the whites versus the blacks, and they were sort of fighting each other. Um, no matter what you call it, you'll say this, see some of the same um, um, disturbances, the same noise, whenever an outburst from uh, the sun comes. And sometimes, if you are lucky or if you search for it on uh, on their the website for this solar observatory, you can actually see the sensor getting completely blinded by an outburst from the sun. So it's it's uh, it's really it's heavy stuff we're we're talking about here. But this is uh, not only exclusive. It's not only exclusively because of these uh, magnetic rotations and outbursts, but they are definitely also also from that. One final thing is that we have solar spots around on uh, on the uh, on the sun, and uh, I can't remember now on the top of my head. Let me see if I have another slide. No, I don't. Uh, what solar spots are made of, why they, they appear. They are um, areas around on the sun where there is some transfer of matter that makes you, give you a, the ability to look further down the sun. And that is why you have this complete black area because there's no radiation emitted from that, that part. Um, usually we tend to ascribe um, uh, solar spots when the sun is very active. So that is when a lot of stuff is happening in the sun and when the sun is sort of in a dormant state, a more dormant state than, than the average, then there's very few to none um, solar spots. Um, the solar spots are just like shadows. They are divided into a penumbra where there's sort of a medium dark, sort of darker shade of the color. And then we have the umbra where it is completely dark and we can obviously have many sun sunspots linked together. And one other thing that you can see when you watch sunspot is that if you have sunspots at the center of the sun and you have some in the sort of in the upper part of the sun or lower part of the sun, you can, you can watch them over several days that the the top sunspots will maybe take a day or two or something like that to travel across the sun, whereas the middle sunspots will be gone in, in, in a matter of hours, almost something like that. And and that is sort of one of the ways that we discovered this differentiated rotation of, uh, of the sun. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, this image is from this uh, solar observatory here. 
So as you can see, when we look at sunspots in visual, um, in, in the visual part of the electromagnetic spectrum, we, we see a black area. But when we look at it in, I'm pretty sure this is infrared or actually perhaps it can be infrared or it can be hydrogen alpha. It's one of those two. We see these sunspots as very bright areas. So why is that? Well, that is because, like I said, the sunspots are sort of, you can see them as sort of a physical encaving in the top of the surface of the sun. So you get to see a part of the sun where the majority of the 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 radiation is in the uh in the infrared the red area so it's infrared so yeah this is most likely infrared but it looks a bit like um looks a bit like like hydrogen alpha also and here we have one of these prominences and you also have uh, flares here and these are generated from the uh like i said the the twisting of this magnetic field so if you sort of imagine that when the this magnetic field is twisted and twisted let me just get my hand above my microphone twisted and twisted and twisted and then it sort of lies at the surface of the sun just where there's there's matter above it and then suddenly it just go boing and it sort of rips part of that matter and a lot of uh, like uh, radiation as well and that matter travels out, so you have these energetic particles and you have radiation all that traveling in that general direction, but also, I mean, like this. And and roughly speaking, uh, if you compare the size of this to the Earth, it would probably be around the size of this little hand here. So you can see why uh, why these, uh, these um, prominences, these outbursts, they can be very dangerous. Uh, particularly for, I mean, electronic devices. And so we have some material that has been ejected by the corona. And when that hits the Earth, we have this, uh, this, um, this magnetic field around the Earth that sort of protect us from some of these, um, these particles. But some of them get through and some of them goes down via the poles here. And when they do that, they can they tend to begin to spin. And when energetic um, particles with um, not with a current, um, they are positive or negative. I can't remember the word for that. <laughs> uh, when they begin to spin in sort of a spiral, they actually begin to emit photons. And there you have either northern uh, lights or southern lights. Uh, they are called Aurora Borealis and Aurora Astralis, um, respectively for the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So that's why we get these uh, lights. It's because of energetic particles that comes primarily from these outbursts here, but they can also sort of come from, I mean, the normal radiation from the sun. The energy, energy production in the sun is by fusion. So like I said in the start, uh, the sun is primarily made of, it's not made of, but it contains primarily hydrogen. So the way that the several chains that we can do this and they change depending on the size of the star, but for the sun, it primarily uses this method here, if not exclusively. So the first step in this chain is that we have two hydrogen atoms colliding together to give us what we call a heavy hydrogen or deuterium. And because we are taking two charges together, um, but only have one charge left <laughs> when we start, so we have, okay, let me try to sort of um, make it more clear for you. You have two positive charged particles. You have a hydrogen and a hydrogen, and they collide together. What you have in that combination is one hydrogen and one neutron, heavy hydrogen or deuterium. But since you have a neutron, you have a charge in surplus. That charge goes out 
as what we call a positron, that's a positive electron. And because of mass, conservation of mass, conservation of energy, we also need to have what is called a neutrino. And that's this little guy here. Um, the, the name neutrino was given by, I think it was Dirac, and it simply means, uh, no, it's, it was not Dirac, it was an Italian, I can't remember the name, but I remember that uh, the name of the particle simply means a little charged particle, a little charged one. So uh, it can, it does only a, that does both a neutrino and an antineutrino, obviously. <laughs> So when we have uh, this um, this um, heavy hydrogen here or, or deuterium, we um, take one of these and another helium, and then we uh, smash those two together, and from that we get what is called um, uh, what's it called? It's it's uh, it's I think we just call it three two helium. So this is hydrogen. This is a helium. And because we have some energy in surplus, we get a gamma, a photon, a gamma ray. Then we take, so we, we need two of these. I, maybe I should have put that in here. We need two of these steps. So we need six hydrogen, right? We need three here and one more to get a 3,2 helium. And then we take two of these 3,2 helium here and smash those together. And then we get a normal helium, 4,2 helium, plus two one, one hydrogen. So we actually get those two back that we started with. So it's sort of an ongoing cycle. And the, the way that we this actually works is, uh, is this uh, famous equation uh, quoted by Einstein. The real equation actually looks a little bit different because there's also momentum in there. But for the sake of, of what we're dealing with here, it's, it's fine enough. So what this equation states is that we have sort of a, um, what do you want to call it? An exchange, if you will, between mass and energy. So if we have a certain amount of, sorry, <laughs> forget that the camera's over here. If we have a certain amount of uh, energy, we can go up to uh, to the bank, and then we can say, "I would like to ex I would like to exchange this energy to get some mass." And the factor, if you will, or the conversion factor, is uh, the speed of light squared. So, if you come with some, in this case, you could say you come with some energy, and then you divide that with c squared, and then you get some mass, or vice versa. If you have some mass, you can um, multiply it with c square, and then you get the energy back. In this case here, we can say that, well, we have the mass. All right. Uh, let me think a little bit about, um... no. Time here is now um, 10 minutes to 12 where I live. And uh, although I would very much like to go on because I mean, I've, I've really missed talking about this stuff. I truly have. Um, I think we have been going on for almost an hour now. And I think that it's, uh, it's about time to, to, uh, to close up the class. There's no homework for today. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I will probably never give you any kind of homework because I can't check it. But nevertheless, let me, let me, uh, let me, reiterate something that's very important here on sort of before we, we close down. Um, the, 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 a couple of the first, uh, I think the first three or two, two or three first uh, lectures I gave was on Twitch, but I've made the, uh, I should have made the, uh, the lectures available so you can watch them um, on demand on YouTube. I will highly recommend that if you haven't done that, go watch these lectures now because all of these lectures should be seen as sort of a progression. So you can, you probably can jump into a middle of a, uh, a lecture and get something out of it. I mean, some knowledge, particularly here in the start. But as we progress up to the more 
physics oriented part with formulas and all that what you learned in the previous lecture will transfer over to the new lecture so i will sort of expect that you know this stuff if you will so uh yes that's sort of all i had to uh say today um i hope that you have uh enjoyed this i try to make it enjoyable but the prim primary thing, of course, is is that you learn something about uh, astronomy. I hope that you're also uh, satisfied with me changing now permanently to do this on YouTube. I think it's, I mean, it's YouTube for this. I think for these kind of things, YouTube is actually a better um, platform than, than Twitch. Twitch is very good for for, uh, for for games, in my opinion. I know that I think it's NASA ESA that that made some 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 uh, some new stuff around the new um, what was it called Perseverance rover that just landed on Mars yes safely so we can get some new new uh, new intelligence some new data from Mars that's very important uh, if you want to figure out whether there's been life on Mars or not and I'm not talking about the song <laughs> it's the life on Mars. Um, yeah, so, so I know that they do it, but I will change permanently now to YouTube, uh, because I don't want to, I, I found out for myself, I don't want to start up a new channel on Twitch, no matter how well it could be or how good it could go. I already have a reasonable established channel here on YouTube, even if you look past all the flat earth stuff. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, uh, and I've, I've, uh, or I just made a video that, um, that I think I've uploaded. Um, if I haven't, I'm, I'm going to do it shortly about Flat Earth. Yeah, but I said this shouldn't be about Flat Earth, so I shouldn't bring it up as well. But yeah, I'm going to do that. Remember, very important, if you come back, I think I'm going to do this next Thursday. I'll try to, to put it in the calendar, the, the schedule, so you can follow it. But as always... I mean, giving me comments and telling me that I'm a really great teacher, that warms my heart. Thank you very much. But if you have questions about this subject, then please say something, because otherwise I'll just move on, and then perhaps it will be a little bit disruptive if we go to a new subject and you just say, ah, oh, by the way, um, it's just like a normal class. But the reason why I do this, the reason why I do this and not just put up videos is because I want this interaction. I mean, one of the things I noticed is that what makes a class really, really good, I mean, in real, in real life, but <laughs> I mean, not online, but when you are in a classroom, is that you have students there, students that can ask you questions, students that can um, engage themselves in the, in, the, uh, in the education. So it's more become sort of a, like a, a conversation than it becomes a monologue. Right now, it's pretty much a monologue, right? I mean, especially, except for you. <laughs> um, but the, that's why I do it like this, and I hope that you will you'll engage with me, and uh, we can have a, a conversation about this. So, yes, um, just to let you know, as always, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like it, you can, you can give it a thumbs down, of course. And if you want to uh, get notified whenever I go online, and uh, and uh, give you a new um, start a new a new lecture. Um, subscribe to my channel, and then you will be notified. I will say this: I'll try to to make it to make these these lectures as regular as I possibly possibly can. But due to the way my family life is at the moment, I I can't make any promises. I'm sorry to say. So that's very important that you uh, that you sort of stay focused on when when you. Subscribe to my channel and you stay focused when I, if you want to follow it, if you, of course. Um, then on the other hand, because I mean it's a two-way street, I will on the other hand um, give you five or ten minutes in advance, so you'll get the notification I'm online, and then will, I will give you sort of a five ten minutes advance before I start the lecture, so you can you can have a chance to I mean grab a cup of coffee and sit down and turn it all on and, and get your computer ready and all that, depending on where you see it. So yeah, that was the words for today. Like I said, I really hope that you uh, learned something, got smarter. That's the point of all this. Uh, when we are, most of us are 
sitting home alone, not not alone, but home, uh, due to this uh, shitty corona deal. Yeah, hope to see you in the next lecture. I'll try to make it Thursday as as well at the same time, but I can't make any promises, sorry.